Uh, thank you very much, Marco, and thank you for the invitation to coming to a very rainy Italy, almost as rainy as it is in Edinburgh. Um, as Marco said, I'm a neurologist, but for the last 10 years I've become uh, more interested in and concerned with the quality of research generally and of animal research in particular. And what I want to do over the next little while is go through what I think some of the issues are, suggest some uh, new ways that we can try and use the approaches that I'm going to tell you about, uh, and then also to suggest how we might try and make animal research a bit more effective. Uh, so it's always important to know the special interests of the speaker, and these are my special interests. I'm a member of the committee in the United Kingdom that regulates animal research, and I'm also a member of the committee in the UK that approves new drugs coming to market. And I've sought and will continue to seek lots and lots of money to do research like I'm going to describe to you uh, today. So clearly, I'll think that this research is very, very important, because if it wasn't important, no one would give me any money. Um, like many parts of Europe, in, in the UK, we have different nations, and they each have their different languages. And sometimes our government gets very excited by this and makes us write our road signs in our different languages so that everybody can understand, even if nobody actually speaks the language. And this is from Wales. This is a road sign that says no entry for heavy goods vehicles, residential site only. And then underneath in Welsh, it says, or it purports to say the same thing. But what it actually says is I'm not in the office just now. Please send any work out to get translated. So the people doing this kind of translation or requesting this kind of translation didn't understand the process that their data went through. So they sent their data, the words, to be translated, and they got an answer back, and they believed the answer without understanding what the process involved. And one of my main theses is that we often use translational medicine to translate things without really understanding what's happening and what the processes are. So here are some examples of where translation goes wrong. This is a functional MRI study, and it involves a functional M MR imaging, which is a technique which looks at changes in cerebral blood flow. And then because it assumes that that cerebral blood flow change must have been driven by changes in activity, that it can detect those parts of the brain that were uh, activated during the time that whatever task the person in the scanner was doing was being performed. And when you set up these scanners, they're very temperamental, and you have to set them up very carefully. Uh, and this group in Boston had a competition in the lab to see who could bring in the most unusual piece of organic material to set up their scanner on a Monday morning. Uh, and one morning, it was Craig Bennett's turn to set up the scanner. Uh, and he, th he didn't have anything to put in the scanner, and he walked past the fish market on his way to work. He said, I tell you what, I'll put a fish into the scanner because nobody's had a fish in the scanner before. So they put the fish in the scanner, and they got it all set up nicely. Uh, and then their patient volunteer that morning didn't turn up. So they said, I tell you what, let's put the fish through the entire scanning protocol. So the fish was uh, 3.8 pounds, about 2 kilos, it was about 18 inches long, and it wasn't alive at the time that they did the scan. But they asked the dead salmon to complete an open-ended mentalizing task. So the salmon was shown a series of pictures of human subjects with a specified emotional valence. That's to say the humans were happy or sad or perplexed. And the salmon was then asked to decide what emotion the person must have been experiencing. And here in the salmon equivalent of the orbitofrontal cortex, there are a number of active voxels where apparently the blood flow has changed. And so they said either we've stumbled onto a rather amazing discovery in terms of post-mortem ichthyological cognition, that's to say they discovered that dead salmon could think, or there was something wrong with all of this experimental approach in fMRI scanning, and that indeed was the case, and they hadn't been correcting for uh, multiple statistic analysis of each one of millions and millions of voxels and for demonstrating this, they won the Ig Nobel Prize in 2012, and rightly so. Here's something that's closer to home. This is the use of web-based analysis tools for gene array experiments. 
So the situation with gene array experiments is that you take a, a biological setup, be it cells or tissues or an organism, and then you compare patterns of gene expression in a ground state and in a stimulated state exposed to drugs or, or some such. Uh, and then when you get the gene array back, it tells you which genes are upregulated and which genes are downregulated, and then you send them away to the internet, and the internet, this ingenuity pathway analysis tool, tells you uh, what genes were importantly regulated and what pathways they belong to, and importantly, how those genes are linked together. Uh, and uh, a colleague, Ruth Dayton, from Edinburgh, not, not one of my colleagues, unfortunately, was doing an experiment with staurosporin-induced apoptosis in nerve cells. And she found 13 genes that were up or down regulated and sent them away to ingenuity pathway analysis that came back with a pathway saying how they were linked. And she looked at the pathway and she didn't understand it and she thought it was stupid. It didn't make sense. It was silly. So, and this, this was her moment of genius. She said, well, well, does it always do that? So she went to Gene Bank and she selected 13 genes at random and she submitted them to IPA. And then she did it again and again and again. And she did that 1,000 times with 1,000 randomly selected groups of genes. And what she found was that the machine said they were all statistically significantly uh, associated together. So the IPA score is the negative logarithm of the odds of those genes being found together by chance alone. And you can see that the median score is 18. That's to say, on average, IPA says that you've identified a path with a, pr with a probability of one in one million, million, million of those genes being associated together by chance alone. And of course, that can't be true. And so there's something wrong with the way that IPA are doing the analysis. And I don't know what it's like in Italy, but in the UK at least, these gene array experiments have launched thousands of grant applications spending millions of pounds of taxpayers' money chasing what are really false statistical associations. And here's another example of where things must be wrong. This is our rat focal cerebral ischemia model where a rat has the middle cerebral artery on one side occluded and then the investigators come back 72 hours later and uh, measure the size of the cerebral infarction. And this is testing low-dose glutamate and homeopathic arnica montana. And this is the control condition. This is half-dose low-dose glutamate. And this is full-dose low-dose glutamate. Uh, but when you actually find out what the concentrations are, half-dose low-dose glutamate is 10 to the minus 120 molar, and full-dose low-dose glutamate is 10 to the minus 60 molar. Can anyone remember what Avogadro's constant is? Six. Yeah. Six times, yeah. Minus 23. So how much glutamate is in here? <laughs> minus 10 to the minus 60 molar. So there's nothing. There's no, nothing. There's nothing at all. Uh, so there's something wrong with this experimental approach that's saying that this is compound is improving outcome, and it's not. And on the back of that, we were interested in trying to develop new treatments for stroke. And we were interested in drugs that we already knew were safe that we might be able to give to patients in the back of an ambulance before they had CT scanning, before they'd had the delay of getting to hospital. And we found, looking 10 years ago now, we found over 1,000 interventions which had been tested in some form of laboratory model of stroke, and of those, over 600 had been tested in that rat model of focal cerebral ischemia that I told you about. Remarkably, 374 of those drugs had efficacy in animal models of stroke. So people had gone on to do clinical trials in some of these. 97 of these had been tested in clinical trial, all of them working in animals, and of those 97, only one clot-busting treatment with TPA actually improves outcome in human stroke, and the others don't improve outcome in human stroke at all. And interestingly, there were three drugs which improve outcome, or three interventions which improve outcome in human stroke, which had never been tested in animals at all. So if I was making an argument for developing new drugs for stroke, it's very plausible to say you should actually not bother with animal experiments at all, because it's much more effective just to choose a drug at random and test it in humans. <clears throat> 
So what I want to do is to tell you a little bit about the methods that we use to create unbiased research summaries of animal research, to talk a little bit about five different types of waste in research that have been identified, most of which apply to animal research, but all of which apply broadly and I think are, are relevant for all of your week here. And on the way through, I'll talk a little bit about risks of bias in animal research, both the impact that those risks of bias have and the prevalence of, that's to say, how often scientists take measures to reduce the risk of bias. I'll talk a little bit about publication bias and selective outcome reporting bias. Then towards the end, I'll talk for about 20 minutes about other uses of research summaries from in vivo research and some from in vitro research, because I think these can be very interesting and exciting tools, and then measures to improve the usefulness of in vivo research and the prospects for successful translation. So, what's a systematic review? Well, a systematic review is a kind of review article where the criteria for identifying and including the data that you're going to consider are determined in advance and are transparent. So if Marco and I both write a review article about problems with research, we'll cite different sources and we'll come to different conclusions. But if we say at the beginning how we're going to identify the information that we're going to use, we're going to have a far better prospect of having agreement as to what the important issues are. And so a systematic review contrasts with and is much more uh, much less biased than our traditional form of narrative review where you go and write an essay and you take the first five publications from PubMed that you can get the PDF before it's time to go to bed and then you write an article based on what those say. And here's an example of quite how biased, uh, how, how biased narrative reviews can be in medicine. This is work from Peter Gottsche in Denmark looking at the use of uh, physical prevention measures vacuuming with HEPA filtered vacuums or freezing bedclothes to try and reduce the prevalence of house dust mites in domestic uh, living quarters in people's homes and the effect that that would have on the rate at which the children who lived in those homes were admitted to hospital. And he found when he looked at this 70 review articles which considered the question of whether these physical measures were, were effective and 63 of those 70 claimed that, in fact, it did work, that this was what you should do. If your child had asthma, you should spend a lot of money on an expensive vacuum cleaner. The study that was most frequently cited in those 63 had only got seven patients in it in total. But there was a systematic review done by the Cochrane Collaboration, which identified 28 trials altogether involving almost 1,000 patients and they found no effect whatsoever of physical measures of improving outcomes. So the narrative review is following the interests, the enthusiasms, the beliefs of the people who write them, but actually when you boil up all the evidence to get an overall answer, the overall answer tells you that it does nothing. So in systematic reviews, a tool that was developed for looking at human clinical trials have only recently been applied to looking at data, to examining data, assessing data from animal in vivo studies. But the concerns and the considerations about how to do them properly are largely the same. So you should have a title that describes what you do. You should have a protocol which exists before you start because otherwise you'll start to be interested in the data that it arises and you'll go and chase shadows and find things which aren't really there. So a whole load of uh, uh, characteristics of a systematic review of animal data. And then a meta-analysis is a statistical technique to combine data from those different studies which can have two or three different purposes. One is to try and provide a best overall estimate of a treatment effect. So if I'm trying to find out whether aspirin is effective in preventing recurrent strokes, I want to know on average how good aspirin is. If I've got an animal study where they've used, tested a drug at five different doses in one animal and four different species uh, altogether and using four or five different outcome measures, well, actually, an average measure of how good the drug is isn't actually much use. It doesn't tell you very much at all. And what's much more interesting is because it can start to tell you the impact of other things on the effect size, on the efficacy of that drug that you observe. And that might be related to the treatment. 
the dose of treatment, the timing of the treatment. It might be related to the animal, the ages of the animals, the sex of the animals, whether the animals have comorbidities or not, and I'll show you examples of this. And importantly, you can also start to discern, identify things about experimental design. Uh, and if people are interested in doing meta-analysis, and it's a great way to learn critically to appraise the literature, uh, normally, uh, you, if you expect studies to have roughly the same results, you weight according to the inverse variance, which is a measure of the precision of the individual studies. So a study that's very precise gets a lot of weight, and a study that's not at all precise is virtually ignored in the meta-analysis. But if you expect the studies to have varying results because you're using different doses or different times to treatment, then you use a different kind of analysis called a random effect meta-analysis. And because of our expectations of what happens in animal data, we always use random effect meta-analysis. And then you can explore differences between studies by exploring uh, how those differences separate out according to different groups, different types of studies. So imagine here that you've got I think this is 10 studies last time I counted. Yes, no, how many is this? I've got 11 studies here. I've got another one since I drew this slide. So imagine you've got 11 studies looking at a treatment effect in animals. If you look at the differences between those studies, you get an overall measure of the heterogeneity, the differences between those studies. But say you've got three different groups of studies with certain characteristics. Perhaps this is using a low dose, an intermediate dose, and a high dose and you group those studies together, you can then measure the differences within each of these groups in terms of the heterogeneity. And by adding these three together, you get the total heterogeneity within these groups. And then what you're left with, if you subtract this from this, is the heterogeneity that's between these that you've explained away by grouping. And you can test that statistically to see if that grouping actually uh, is important or whether it just represents statistical noise. And if you're interested, there's a, a sort of how to do it guide uh, for meta-analysis of animal studies in the Journal of Neuroscience Methods earlier this year. Now, the problem with meta-analysis is that you're not setting out to design an experiment to test a hypothesis. What you're doing is observing the data that have come from lots and lots of different experiments testing a different hypothesis. And so meta-analysis is a form of observational research, and it's got all the difficulties that go along with observational research. This is my favorite piece of observational research, I think. These are the 50 states of the United States of America, and they're ranked according to their average IQ, as determined by the American Psychological Association, from Connecticut at the top here, being the most intelligent with an average IQ of 123, to Mississippi at the bottom with an average IQ of 65. And then they're color-coded as to whether they voted for George Bush or John Kerry in the American presidential elections. And you can see that in the Electoral College in America, all of the clever states voted for the Democrats and all of the stupid states voted for the Republicans. Now, while you and I might believe that there is a causal relationship between average IQ and voting behavior. This doesn't show causality, it just shows association. And all of the stuff that I'm gonna show you shows association, but not causality. It's strange, this is the only slide that people ever take photographs of. Do you <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, some of you may have seen in The Lancet at the beginning of this year, a series of articles that were led by Ian Chalmers and Paul Glasiou on five different types of waste in research. And what I want to do is to go through those with some examples, particularly as relates uh, to animal studies. Uh, and so I was involved, I, I was involved in uh, writing a commentary at the beginning and I was also involved in, in this one which applies particularly to animal research and, and to this one that Rustam wrote as well about uh, about research regulation and management, and I know that in terms of regulation and management of animal research in Italy, you've had your own local difficulties recently. So these are the five stages at which uh, waste can occur. Questions which are relevant to research users, because if you're asking a question that no one's gonna use the answer from, there's no point in doing the research and you're wasting resource. Appropriate research design, conduct and analysis, efficient research regulation and delivery, the reports of the research been accessible 
and fool, that's to say there not being a publication bias, and the reports being unbiased and usable, that's to say the study describes what they did in sufficient information to people both to replicate the research and also to use the results. So if I say we tested aspirin and stroke, but I don't tell you what dose of aspirin we used, you can't use that aspirin treatment. So the, the reporting needs to be complete. And I'll focus particularly on studies that taking adequate steps to reduce bias, on studies being published in full, and publication of studies with disappointing results. So in the setting of research priorities, we have to think of what our research results will be used for. Now, of course, there's no harm in what we call blue skies research, in research that is done simply for the advancement of knowledge. And this, is, this was described and pointed out by Louis Pasteur in what's called Pasteur's Quadrant here, where you've got research which is relevant to the advancing of knowledge or relevant to immediate application. And if you've got research which is neither relevant to advancing knowledge or to immediate application, we would say that that's wasted. This is Pasteur's quadrant here, where you've got research which is both relevant to advancing knowledge and with immediate application. And of course, that's very good research to do, but there's other important parts of research. The Curie quadrant here, pure basic research, without consideration of relevance to practical issues, but leading, in her case, to the development of x-rays. Very important. And the Dole quadrant here, pure applied research, which doesn't really advance knowledge at all, but answers the important practical question in his case as to whether cigarette smoking was harmful. So how good are we at setting priorities for research? Well, if we look at basic science research, uh, and this is looking at a sample of more than 25,000 reports in six basic science journals from 1979 to 1983, of these, only 101 claimed that the new discoveries had a clear clinical potential. This is going to, going to change human health. So 101 claims. By 20 years later, 1983 to 2003, only five had resulted in licensed clinical interventions, and only one intervention was in widespread use. So while people are doing research that they claim when they write their grants and they write their papers, this is going to transform the management of Mark Arlen infarction or prostatic carcinoma or whatever. Very few uh, reports of research actually do transform clinical practice. And then the other issue is about who sets the priorities for research. So this is three different groups of people. Uh, and this is research about education and training, service delivery, psychological interventions, or, or research about radiotherapy and surgery and interventions and devices. And this is research about drugs and vaccines and biological treatments. If you go to patient groups and ask them what their priorities are for research, fully 55% say they think the priorities are education and training and service delivery. About a quarter think it's uh, uh, devices and surgery and the like. And less than a quarter think the development of new drugs is important. But if we look at non-commercial trials, there are many more drugs and many fewer educational interventions. And if we look at registered commercial trials done by people trying to make money out of the healthcare system, about 87% of them are about drugs and vaccines and biologicals, and hardly any are about education and training and service delivery. So the research that we do isn't relevant to the priorities of the people who were doing the research on behalf of, that's to say, the patients with the diseases. And if you go to patients with the disease and say what research is important for you, remember I'm interested in developing treatments for acute stroke that will make stroke smaller and let people walk again. Is that their priority? Well, no. The first priority, what's the best way to improve cognition after stroke? What are the best ways to help people come to terms with the long-term consequences of stroke? Aphasia, best treatments for arm recovery and, for, and so on and so on and so on. And actually, treatments that reduce the size of the infarct on a scan are very low down patients' lists of priorities. So our recommendations under this heading was that research should be conducted to, identif uh, to identify factors associated with optimal replication of basic research, translation in to the, of the application to, to healthcare, and also the balance between those drug studies and the studies in education and training and the like. And funders should make information available about how they decide what research to support, 
and they should fund research which works out the best ways of involving users of research in decisions of what to fund and what not to fund. They should make available to everybody who was interest, interested in it information about research and progress and make sure that people know what research is in progress uh, before they embark on their next study. So the next day is design, conduct and analysis. So one of the things is that people do research that has been done before. So this is looking at reports published in, in you know, high-impact medical journals, the Lang Lancet, New England Journal, British Medical Journal, JAMA, Annals. How many studies claimed that the clinical trial was the first to address the question? Only five out of 29, five out of 35. This is in 2009 and 2012. But how many actually systematically reviewed those previous studies excuse me, to inform their clinical trial design? Well, only one in each. So they knew that there had been previous research, but they didn't review it systematically before deciding how to go on and do their research. And while they knew that they weren't the first study, only four of these, only 10 of these, actually referred to the other randomized clinical trials. And for these, 10 in 2009 and uh, 13 in 2012, there was a previous systematic review that had been done, uh, but they didn't use it in the design of the study. And having a study protocol is really important because if you don't have a study protocol, things will occur by chance in your study and you'll start to believe that it's important. And if you start to believe that it's important, you might, might start to treat patients differently. And even if you don't treat patients differently, you might do another study to see whether uh, this particular factor is associated with study working or not. So this study, ISIS-2, was a study of myocardial infarction. It was a sister trial to GIZI, which was the large Italian study of thrombolysis for myocardial infarction, and found that aspirin improved outcome in myocardial infarction. But there was a non-significant of worsening of outcome for patients who were born under the star signs of Gemini and Libra. Now, of course, nobody's going to say, well, if you're, if you're, if you're a Gemini... Uh, you shouldn't have this treatment. But what instead if it had been a star sign? What if it had been that in patients with a prior history of migraine this wasn't effective, detected after the study? Then, then you can imagine the editorials that would be written saying you shouldn't use this in patients with migraine because it's bad, because it's wrong. Uh, and you can find just about anything if you look in a large enough population. So here's half of the population of Ontario in Canada. And this is the odds ratios for hospitalization over a five-year period for 5.3 million residents by their sign of birth. And you can see significantly increased risk of these various conditions. So if you've got Scorpio, increased odds of lymphoid leukemia. Librians have uh, higher rates of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, and I'm a Virgo, so I think I'm all right. Um, but they found significantly increased odds of admission for 24 of the 223 most common conditions. But when they looked carefully at it in a separate validation cohort, testing the hypothesis, they still found that two of those 24 held up and were still significant. And it's only when they tested also, when they accounted for multiple statistical testing, that they found that none of the 223 worked. So unless you're very clear at the beginning what you're setting out to measure, you will be misled by the data as they arrive. Uh, so a bit about risk of bias. So what's, what's this about? Well, this is about how valid the find, findings of an experiment are, the extent to which an experiment accurately describes what happens in that model system. And it might be confounded by selection bias if the animals going into the experiments are different at the beginning. And they might be selected because they're different. By performance bias because the lesion or the drug is given differently because you know what treatment they're getting by detection bias, where the outcome is measured differently because of your pre, uh, preconceptions about what the drug's going to do. Attrition bias, where if you don't report the dropouts, and I'll show you an example of this, then you can, uh, you can mislead yourself. And false positive reporting bias, where the sample sizes aren't adequate. And again, I'll show you examples of this. But there are many, many examples of failures to replicate findings from basic science, and there's just a couple here. So Bayer in Germany, uh, drug companies these days don't seem to do very much fundamental research. What they do is read the scientific journals and see if they think something is interesting enough to try and make it into a drug target. And they looked at their experience over four years of taking findings from the academic literature and try and, trying to replicate those findings in-house. 
and found they could only replicate 36% of these. And Glenn Begley at Amgen did a similar thing with compounds for the treatment of cancer that they took in-house in Amgen and tried, first of all, simply to replicate what was in the literature. And they were only able to do that in 11% of occasions. So 89% were non-replicable and were probably wrong. And what might the reasons for that be? Well, this is looking at a random sample of uh, both laboratory in vivo and in vitro research. Uh, publication selected at random from PubMed, looking at the reporting of blinded assessment of outcome in green here, less than 10%. Conflicts of interest statement, not very good up until very recently when it's become really quite prevalent, and randomization increasing gradually over the years from 1980 to after 2006. So the reporting of these measures to reduce the risk of bias is poor. This is an example of a drug that was tested in ischemic stroke called NXY059, a free radical scavenger, tested in two large clinical trials involving over 5,000 patients. And when the second clinical trial was neutral, we went back to the animal data that had been used to inform that clinical trial. And what we found was 11 publications describing 29 experiments involving a total of just over 400 animals. So not very many animals, really. But overall, this gray bar here... NXY059 improving outcome in these, uh, improving infarct volume in these animals with stroke by about 44%. So a very powerful effect for a drug in an animal. But if you separate those experiments and do that partitioning of heterogeneity that I told you about earlier, then the high quality studies, the ones that randomized, that had blinded conduct of the experiment and blinded assessment of outcome, all said that NXY was substantially and significantly less effective than the high-quality studies. And of those 11 publications, not one did all three of these things, and the two that were used by AstraZeneca to support their clinical trial program did none of these things. So perhaps it's not surprising in retrospect that NXY059 was ineffective in human clinical trial. There's another issue about how much data they had for NXY059. So this is a cumulative meta-analysis of clot-busting treatment in animal models of stroke, the one drug that does work in animal stroke and in human stroke. So what we've got here is the first two experiments, 1988, and then the first three, four, five, six, so on experiments until you've got something like 250 experiments altogether. And you can see that as you add to the data, you get a much more precise estimate of how good TPA is in animal stroke models but also you get this regression to the mean that the effect size gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So where did NXY go to clinical trial? NXY went to clinical trial when there were only 400 animals up here. Quite an imprecise estimate of how good it was in animals. Uh, there's also the issue that I talked about earlier on about comorbidities. These are animals that have comorbidities that might reflect human comorbidities. This is NXY059 here. 7% of animal studies use animals with high blood pressure, uh, and you can see that in the animals with high blood pressure, again, this drug is hardly effective at all. For TPA, the drug which does work, again, only 9% of animals had high blood pressure. Again, it didn't work in animals with high blood pressure, but the investigators were lucky enough to have decided to rule out humans with high blood pressure from their clinical trial in case it made their blood vessels pop when they opened up the blood supply. So by luck, they did the right clinical trial, which was consistent with the where efficacy had been shown in animals. So this is an example of the problem with blinding. This is an experiment that was done uh, over 50 years ago by an American psychologist called Robert Rosenthal. And he ran a course in graduate animal psychology. And at the end of the course, this student all had to do an experiment and what they had to do was to compare cognitive performance in two cohorts of rats. One cohort of rats had been bred over many generations in Berkeley to perform well in cognitive tasks and the other, uh, the other group had been bred and inbred presumably over many generations to perform poorly in those same cognitive tasks. And the, the rats were given this task where they were put in the stem of a tea maze and there was one arm was dark and one was bright and these were alternated at random and the dark arm was always reinforced with food. So they, they worked out how quickly the rat learned to turn to the dark side in the maze. 
And what they found was that the maize bright animals started off better than the maize dull animals. And while both cohorts of animals improved over time, the improvement in the maize bright animals was substantially more, more effective, uh, more noticeable. And when he asked them what they thought of their animals, they thought that their maize bright animals were bright eyed with wet noses and lovely and cuddly and friendly animals and the maize dull animals bit four of them. Uh, and in fact, of course, the experiment wasn't done on the animals, the experiment was done on the students because there was no difference between these two cohorts of animals. They were drawn at random from the same cages of the same animal house on the first day of the experiment and the only difference between them was in the minds of the students handling the animals and doing the experiment. So you've got to be very careful to make sure that things are blinded. And this is evidence from other neuroscience domains about blinding. Here's the data from stroke you've seen for NXY059. Here's data in multiple sclerosis for uh, experimental allergic encephalomyelitis modeling, where high quality studies give lower estimates of efficacy. In Alzheimer's disease in the Morris water maze, high quality studies give, studies give much lower estimates of efficacy. On average, studies using transgenic models of Alzheimer's disease testing drugs in the Morris water maze, which are blinded, barely show any significant improvement in outcome at all on average. And here's in Parkinson's disease again with these behavioral outcomes in a 6-hydroxydopamine unilateral lesioning model, substantially and significantly lower estimates of efficacy in high quality studies. So all of that would be fine if only 10% or 20% of the studies were low quality. But if it was more than that, it would be much more of an issue. So in uh, our group, Camarades, we've done systematic reviews which up to a couple of years ago had included data from over 2,500 primary publications. And what we've done here is look at the different disease conditions that we've been interested in the models of. So Alzheimer's disease, focal ischemia, glioma, Huntington's, hemorrhage, multiple sclerosis, myocardial infarction, spinal cord injury. And this is the prevalence of the reporting of randomization at about 27 or 28 percent. This is the prevalence of the reporting of blinding on average at about 30 percent. This is the prevalence of reporting of sample size calculations. The y-axis has changed. It's about 1 percent. About 1 in 100 studies report sample size calculations. And conflict of interest statements equally round about 10 percent. So on average, in the areas that we've looked at for our systematic reviews, uh, there is very poor reporting of measures to reduce the risk of bias. And so when we started to present this data, these data, we were told that that's because neuroscientists were stupid, that everyone else knew that these things were important. It was just us, and, and we had to get ourselves sorted out. Um, the other thing that we do, did at the time was we uh, looked at whether high-quality journals or supposedly high-quality journals reported high-quality research. So we took those... 2,691 publications, and then we looked at the impact factor of the journal in which that work was published, so we could then look at the reporting of randomization of blinding, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, by in, in deciles of journal impact factor. So here's conflict of interest statement. These are the publications in the journals with the lowest impact factor, the publications in the journals with the highest impact factor. And you can see that there is an improvement in conflict of interest reporting in journals of high impact. For power calculations, though, there is no such relationship. For blinding, there is no such relationship. And remember how important I showed you these things were. And for randomization, there is, in fact, an inverse relationship in that work published in high impact journals is likely to be of lower methodological quality than work published in low impact journals here. So when I had my recent annual review with my boss back in Edinburgh, I said, great news, Jonathan. All of my work is published in journals like this, so it must be better, must be high quality, higher quality than your guys who are in nature and science and cell and neuron. So because we'd been told that this just was neuroscientists, we decided that we would sample all of the literature. So every publication in PubMed has got a unique eight-digit identifier that goes up to about 25 million, which is the number of publications indexed in PubMed. And so if you take a random number between 1 and 25 million, you can get a randomly selected publication. And if you do that 2,000 times, you end up with something like 147 publications which describe animal research. 
And this is the reporting of randomization here, about 17%, blinding, 3%, none doing a power calculation, conflict of interest statement, about 14% in that random sample from PubMed. And this is change over time. Randomization seems to be increasing as the years go by, which is good. Blinded assessment of outcome may be increasing as time goes by. I can't show you change in sample size calculation because none of them ever did a sample size calculation. But conflict of interest reporting has gone way, way up just in the last six or seven years. And I think this is an important observation because the reason that this has happened is that journals have required the authors to state whether or not they have a conflict of interest. And since journals now have started to require authors to state whether they randomize, whether they blinded, I think that that should start to improve things for these other issues. So then we were told that it's, it, it's not just the neuroscientists, all right, we agree that, and you can't, you can't tell something's good just because it's published in a journal of high impact, we agree that, and on average things are pretty poor, but you've got to know who the lab is, you've got to know the university they come from, and that they've got a reputation for good research. Unfortunately, in the UK, we know which universities have a reputation for doing good research because we have this thing called the research assessment exercise that every five years ranks universities for how good their research is and then gives them money according to how good they are in a kind of reverse socialism, sort of Robin Hood the wrong way around. Um, and what they concluded was that the top five institutions had made an outstanding contribution to the internationally excellent position of the UK in biomedical sciences particularly impressed by the strength in the neurosciences. And, uh, and we didn't really believe this. Uh, so what we did was we went to the top five institutions in the UK, University College London, Imperial, Oxford, Cambridge, and my own institution, the University of Edinburgh, and we identified all of the in vivo research they'd published in the two years after this, so 2009, 2010, identifying 1,173 publications. And this is what we see. I've not named the institutions because I would like to have a job. Uh, but here you see reporting of randomization at about 15%, blinding on average at about 20%, inclusion and exclusion criteria about 10%, power calculations 2 or 3%. And just note that you can actually separate out statistically worse or statistically better institutions on the basis of this kind of analysis, which took us about... 10 weeks full time and would be a lot cheaper than a lot of the research assessment exercises that are done in many, many countries. We've got those data from 2009-10. So we can go to 2009-10 to our random sample from PubMed and to our 2,691 publications from Camaraderie's systematic reviews. So RAE, about 17% reporting randomization in that sample. In our systematic reviews in those years, the reporting of randomization is almost 40%. And in our random sample from PubMed in those years, the reporting of randomization was 50%. So on average, statistically, a publication picked at random from PubMed is likely to be of higher quality than a publication from one of the top five UK leading universities, which is worrying, I think. So, recommendations under this heading. Because of the, di the, di the risks that you're not going to follow your protocol and you're going to find something which is interesting but irrelevant and a chance finding, make your protocol, your statistical analysis plan, your raw data available for all biomedical research. And we are doing this now. We just dump into FigShare our data files for all of our publications. Uh, and I think that, that will make things much more transparent. Funders and regulators should require research proposals to be justified by systematic reviews, and they should fund such reviews. And we should maximize the effect to bias ratio, one of Johnny Nidus's favorite terms, by having defensible standards of design and conduct, a well-trained methodological research workforce, and this is part of the training of the methodological research workforce, continuing professional development for scientists, and involvement of non-conflicted stakeholders in decisions about how to do things. And then reward, and, and if any of you get a chance to look at uh, the more, I think PLOS last week or the week before, Johnny Anidis had an article putting, making a proposal for a new way of rewarding scientists, but reward through funding and promotion and reputation, high research standards and promoting a culture of replication in research. 
So regulation and management. So this is a quote from someone in 1965 or 1966 when all of this research ethics was just kicking off. Now, I believe in research ethics. I just think sometimes it's overdone. And what he said was, the clinician who's convinced that a certain treatment works will find nothing in their way, and no ethicist will challenge them. Whereas co his colleague in the next office, who wonders and doubts and wants to find out, will stumble over piles and piles of ethicists stopping them from doing just about anything. These are delays and inconsistencies in the time taken to approve one month, two months, and three months clinical trials in dermatology and orthopedics, mental health, flu vaccinations, etc., 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 and getting governance approvals within an institution, nothing less than a month, and some going out to two months. And Jeremy Farah, who's the new director of our Wellcome Trust, talks about this in the context of SARS and Ebola, that your prospects of getting any decent clinical research about vaccine outbreak endemic diseases is virtually nil, when by the time you, even if you have your trial protocol ready to submit on the day the first patient is infected with Ebola, the, the pandemic will have finished by the time you get your permission to recruit your first patient into the study. So we need to fix that. One of the ways you can do that is through the establishment of research networks. These are clinical research networks in the UK. Number of patients recruited to clinical trials, 2009-10, over 100,000, but more than doubled in uh, only four years since the setting up of the UK clinical research networks. And the same thing I would argue holds for animal research as well, that you can do more, better animal research if you do multi-centre animal studies in the context of research networks rather than single bench, single lab, single investigator studies. So regulators should reduce waste. They should streamline and harmonise laws, regulations, guidelines that govern how and where the research can be done. I'm uh, one of the chief investigators for a European trial of hypothermia in stroke, and you may have heard that in Europe, we, Europe we've got harmonised clinical trial regulations for doing clinical trials in different member states. They may be harmonised on paper, but they are not harmonised in fact. And two years after our first centre went live, we only have three countries live because of getting regulatory approval in these other countries that are supposedly members of this same identical harmonized system. And researchers should use designs which maximize efficiency of recruitment, retention, data monitoring, and we should be doing research into how efficiency can be increased. One of the things that we uh, tried to do when we wrote this series was to say who was responsible for doing little bits of it. But actually, it turns out that for most of our recommendations, everyone has a responsibility including uh, me and you. Accessible and full reports. So this is work which might be done but not published. Uh, and so this is, this is from countries, USA, UK, Australia, and so on, 1980 to 1996, 1997 to 2005, looking at studies where they've gone to ethics committee and say, give us a list of the trials which you've agreed. And then they've gone to the literature 10, 20 years later and say, give us a list of the publications which have come out of this. And this is the proportion that are published. So in the US, about 65%, 40% in the UK, less than that in France, Spain, not very good. On average, taking all of that together, 50% of clinical trials remain unpublished, even though they've been completed. And of course, those trials are much more likely to be neutral or negative. And so we're giving patients treatments on the basis that we think we wor they work because we don't know about all this stuff that's not going to call them up here, which presumably say the drugs don't do very much at all. And where does that problem with publication bias arise? Well, this is looking at different inception cohorts of studies in four pairs. So these are studies, if you look at when the study started recruitment, 12 cohorts of studies, 73% of the ones with a positive finding were published, only 50% of the ones with a neutral finding or negative finding were published. If you look at the ones that were submitted for regulatory approval, so this is FDA regulatory approval of the drug where the companies are duty bound to give all of the data, 88% of the positive ones had been published, only 54% of the negative ones have been published. But missing out this bit, coming down to the bottom here, 
This is looking at manuscripts submitted to journals. And this shows the same rate of publication, whether they're negative or positive. So publication bias is not because journals are saying, we don't want to publish your neutral clinical trial. It's because the people doing the trial are either unwilling, if it's drug industry, or can't be bothered, if it's an academic investigator, to go through the trouble of submitting their findings for publication. So it's not just the journals, it's us as well. Uh, and this is uh, looking at uh, differential reporting of hazard uh, versus benefit. So this is a drug uh, called reboxetine, which is an SSRI uh, for reported and unreported randomized trials, uh, which were, had all been submitted to the FDA as part of a regulatory approval. You can see that if you look at the reported trial, the drug looks very good. If you look at the six unreported trials, it doesn't look nearly so good. And on average, this drug doesn't do very much. But if you just looked at the reported trial, you'd think it was great. If you look at the hazard, the harms, in the reported trial, there was two trials that reported hazard, and they say there's no hazard here. The unreported trials, there's hazard for sure, and in total, there's hazard for sure. So it's not just overstating benefit, it's understating harms. I'll show you some examples of that in animals later on. This is about animal data being published in full. This is a systematic review of animal models of allergic and uh, experimental allergic encephalomyelitis, the animal model for multiple sclerosis, of which more later. And Hannah Vesterinen, who was a PhD student with me, identified almost 10,000 publications that were potentially relevant uh, to the question she was asking, uh, found 1,700 interventions which had been tested in these models. And we were interested in those which had been tested, those drugs which had been tested five or more times. And so there were 200 publications that we were interested in. But of those, we had to exclude 72, that's to say a third, because either they didn't report the variance of their data, they didn't report the number of animals per group, they didn't report either the error or the number of the group, or they were uninterpretable, or they said they'd got controls, but they didn't give us data for the controls. So about a third of studies were wasted, useless, we couldn't use because of the way they'd been reported. This is the Morris Water Maze looking uh, again, in Alzheimer's disease studies with Kieran, another PhD student now with the WHO in Geneva. One of the, th so in a Morris Water, who's familiar with Morris Water Maze? Stick your hand up, yeah, nod, yeah. So you've got a pool and you've got visual cues and you put the animal in the water and the animal learns to get out of the water onto a platform and then you hide the platform and the animal swims around saying, where's that bloody platform, I'm getting wet. So there's important things that give the versive stimulus for the animal to get out of the platform and it's also important to know how big this pool is because that determines whether the animal is going to swim a long distance or a short distance. And here's the distance used, a meter diameter, 120, 150. But here, 25% don't actually say how big the pool that they used was. What gets the animal out of the water is the temperature. It doesn't like the cold water. 40% don't tell you what the water temperature was and it ranges from 16 up to 28 degrees. And number of days training and number of trials per day, important information if you're going to try and replicate this, you want to know if the animals have been well trained or whether they're just, uh, whether the training has just been achieved. And you can see the modal response is an unknown number of acquisition trials per day and an unknown number of days training. So it's virtually impossible to replicate these findings in Alzheimer's disease because you don't know what it was that they did. This is about reporting outcomes. This is some of our research looking at, uh, at uh, a combination of treatment of magnesium, melatonin, uh, and minocycline in uh, animal focal ischemia. And if we just focus on the middle here, this is the median behavioral outcome in the control group. And if we look at the median behavioral outcome in the treatment group, it's actually improved. It's a bit higher. But that's because we weren't able to measure the behavioral outcome in those five animals which had died. And many studies in ischemic stroke don't report how many animals died. And so under those situations, you would think, hey, look, this is better, particularly because the group size is the same. This treatment improves outcome when, in fact, this treatment kills animals. And the, medians, the median behavioral outcome in those that haven't died is just the same. Publication bias more directly than in animal studies. This is looking at uh, a number of experiments that we've identified in systematic reviews in stroke. 
in EAE measuring neurobehavioural inflammation, demyelination, axon losses and outcome, Alzheimer's studies looking at the Morris water maze or plaque burden, large number of experiments, large enough to be able to test stati statistically for the presence of publication bias. And we estimate that about 20%, or an additional 20% of studies remain unpublished. And that leads to an overstatement of efficacy of about one third. So if you go to the animal literature and believe what's in the literature, for a variety of reasons which I've told you, but for publication bias alone, you're going to get an overstatement of efficacy. And this is interesting. This is looking at, to human, at animal toxicological studies. So this is where you've got a potential toxin that you want to license for use in household wares, in milk bottles, in whatever. You've got to show the regulators, in this case the EPA, that the, that the chemical is safe. And one of the concerns about toxicity is reproductive toxic toxicity, that, that mothers exposed to this chemical might have deformed babies. And so the experiment is you expose pregnant rats to the chemical and then you measure the size of the babies. And if you do that, you find that there isn't really very much effect at all, except when you correct for publication bias, these red dots here, there is in fact a substantial publication bias. So for diseases modeled in animals like stroke and like multiple sclerosis, we observe an improvement in outcome of about 40%, but when we correct for publication bias, that falls to 30%. But where the outcome is a harm that I might not want to get reported if I'm the chemical company that's funded the research because I want to get a license for my chemical, then you observe a harm of 0.3 standard deviation units when in fact when you correct for publication bias, the harm is almost double that. So publication bias, as for benefit and side effects in clinical trial, in animal research, publication bias can work both ways. And next, there's an issue of uh, excess significance. This is where you find more studies in the literature that are positive than can possibly be relevant or true. And this is where we did with Johnny and just looking at over 4,000 experiments which we'd identified we observed 1,700 of those to present statistically significant effects. But given the results of all of those individual studies and the distribution of their exact p-values, we would have expected only about half of that number of positive studies. So there's a suppression here overall of about 50% of outcomes. And if you take that into account looking at meta-analyses, and boil down meta-analyses from 160 that suggested that a drug might be beneficial, uh, 112 with significant benefits in a fixed effects analysis, one to account for small study effects and excess significance, down to 47, more than 500 animals, that was the cutoff for NXY, remember, you've only got eight interventions from those 116 animals that you would say this should really work in humans. Uh, and here are those interventions, and for, uh, for sure bromocryptine does work in Parkinson's disease. We don't know about stem cells and ICH. We know for sure that none of these interventions work in stroke, with the possible exception of NOS donors, and we don't know about myelin basic protein in EAE. So can those multiply positive studies be, be plausible? So assume that you've got a publication that describes six independent experiments. You're testing the hypothesis that uh, gray hair is associated with a taste for red wine, and you're testing that in a gene array experiment and uh, an in vitro experiment with an iPS cell line taken from inside my cheek, and then an in vitro experiment with it. So you're testing it independently in six different experiments. And assume that each of those experiments is separately is powered at about 50%. That's to say, if there is a biological effect, it's got a 50% chance of detecting it. And that's generous because most animal studies are powered at 20 to 30%. Then the probability, if your mechanistic hypothesis is correct, the probability that at least one of those six will be positive is 98%. The, positive, the, the probability that all six will be positive is 2%. So next time you go to Nature or PNAS or the Journal of Neuroscience and read a paper that's got six different panels testing a mechanistic hypothesis in six different ways, and they all are significant at less than 0.05, ask yourself how on earth that can be true. Because most papers, they're all significant at less than 
not five. And this is what I think is happening. If you do six studies, this is the decay of probability of having one, two, three, four, five, six of them being positive down to 3%, 2%, 3% if the studies are powered at 50%. And what I think is actually happening is they probably measured 12 outcomes, did 12 independent experiments. And the only ones they've reported are the ones which are positive and the ones that are negative aren't reported. So that gives you a much better chance here of getting all of your panels in nature lining up. But it does mean that I'm going to, as a reader, I'm going to have an exaggerated sense of how uh, well their data fit with their hypothesis. And there's an issue about group size and efficacy as well. If, if you want to know the background to this, you should read the Johnny and Edith Why Most Published Research is False uh, paper from uh, PLOS Medicine from 2005, which goes into the statistics of this. But essentially, a, a, a study that's underpowered, even if it gives you a statistically significant result, has got a much lower positive predictive value. That's to say that, 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 that those findings will generalize to other tests than if it's an adequately powered study. And this, interestingly, is an observation <coughs> that we've made in the EAE literature that, that would seem to support that, in that if you look at studies that have only got one to four animals per group, they get huge effect sizes. And as the uh, number of animals per group increases, the average effect size falls. And I think why that is, is if I'm an effect size, if my head's my effect size, and these are my 95% confidence limits, then... If I'm a small study, I've got large confidence limits, and so I've got to be taller for my hand to be off the ground. Whereas if I'm a small study, a large study, I've got small, so I can be smaller and still get off the ground. So it's because if you come down here, so the small studies aren't published because, the, the, sorry, the, the, the small studies with a low number of animals that give small estimates of effect size aren't published because the confidence limits are so huge, they give a non-significant finding, so they're not published. And the large studies with a small effect have got narrower confidence limits, which are statistically significant, so they are published. So the answer is do large studies, because even if your effect is small, you'll still get it to be significant and you'll get published. So you can do some power calculations, and these are for EAE, looking at how many animals you might need per group to detect an effect of different size. So uh, this is the power normally uh, in clinical trials now. We would aim for 90% power. That would be way up here. That's to say you do the experiment 10 times and you've got a true biological effect. Nine times you get the answer you're looking for and once your study's falsely negative. So you've got to ask yourself how many years of your PhD are you prepared to spend doing experiments on something which is there but you're not going to detect. So how many weeks in a year? Let's say, so there's 52 weeks in a year. If you're doing studies powered at 30%, that means that 15 weeks in the year, you're getting research that is worthwhile. And for the rest of the year, because your studies are underpowered, you're not going to pick stuff up. So most animal studies are powered around about 30%. That's to say, for a 15% effect size in EAE, to be powered at 30%, you need about 20 animals per group. And up here, of course, you need many, many more animals per group to detect that 15% effect size. Although larger effect sizes, you need smaller groups. Still, about 20 animals per group for 90% power. <coughs> this is another way of looking at it, the number of animals per group and the sort of effect size you can, you can detect. So if you're powered at 90% up uh, in, in this line up here, then if you've got 20 animals per group, you can detect a 30% improvement in outcome and nothing smaller than that. And so for those of you who do animal experiments, have a think about how likely you are to have adequate power, and this is just another way of representing it. So assume a two-group experiment then, seeking a 30% reduction in infarct volume with an observed variance of 40% of the control infarct volume, which is roughly where most animal stroke studies are. These are the number of animals that you have and the power that you get and the proportion of animals that are wasted, the proportion of your time that's wasted, the proportion uh, of your reagents that are wasted. So the chances of wasting an experiment in that setup in stroke, if you've got 10 animals per group, you've got about a 70% chance that your experiment's wasted, that you, that you should have stayed in bed today. So you should do larger experiments. And so the issue is when do you know that something actually works? And I would argue in meta-analysis, <coughs> 
This is where the NXY data lie. Hypothermia and TP, as I've said, are both way down here. I would have thought that by the time you get to about 1,000 animals, which is about here, then you've got a reasonably robust estimate of how effective a treatment is in animals. So institutions and funders should reward full dissemination of research, reuse of original data sets, and you can't do that unless the data sets are deposited, standards for the content of study pr protocols, full study reports, and data sharing policies, and everyone should endorse and enforce study registration policies, wide availability of full study information and sharing of participant level data for all health research, including research involving animals. And then on to complete and usable reporting. If you think in a clinical study about all the various different bits of data there are, but in an animal study as well, if you've got telemetry on an animal, you've got gigabytes of data that might be useful to someone somewhere to use. And how can you make that available to people? Well, fortunately, since we've got the internet and fig share and data storage is cheap, we can now make these available. And we should make them available at the time that we actually collect the data. And I'll come on to that in a minute, but this is looking at studies, uh, uh, at clinical trials, uh, and how usable the data might be. So the abstract, the effect size and the confidence intervals were missing in 38%, no mention of adverse effects in 50%, inadequate treatment dis uh, descriptions in up to 90%, fMRI studies, poor again, 65% uh, of studies with a survey didn't tell you what the survey questions were. 31% uh, of graphs are ambiguous, outcome missing, 50% of efficacy results for clinical trials are uh, the outcomes missing, number of animals and raw data missing in lots and lots of animal studies, no systematic attempt to set results in the context of previous research in 50%. And this was a, uh, presented a couple of years ago at a conference in Chicago where they went to clinical trials where the authors had said data available on request from the author. So they wrote to the author saying, can I have your data? And the median survival of clinical trial data is seven years from publication, by which time they could only get 50% of the data back. So the attrition rate of data deposition is about 7% per year. And if someone, if any of you have been in the game long enough to have been in it for seven years to try and work out what's in your lab books from seven years ago, it would be difficult to find if someone came to ask you. Uh, and so making data available at the time of publication, I think, is crucial to all of this. So this is the, usable, uh, the, the, the usefulness of the reporting, setting results in the context of previous systematic reviews. And you can see that uh, when we started all of this in 97, two-thirds didn't set the results in the context of a previous systematic review. Now a bit better, but a long, long, a long, long way to go. And the number of studies that, that have an updated systematic review, which is in the editorial policies of most of the journals that publish this work, the number is very, very small. So research regulations and rewards must align better with more and more complete reporting. We've got a funder in the UK called the HTA Board, the Health Technology Assessment Board, and the way they do it, they, they publish, or sorry, 97% of the trials which they fund are published. It's the best uh, proportion anyone in the world gets. And the way they do that is they withhold 10% of the grant funding until the work is available in, the paper, in, in, in a publication. So if everyone did that, all of our data would get published very quickly because my institution would be saying, where are your data? We need to find out what's happening. Research funders should take responsibility for an infrastructure that supports good reporting and archiving, improve the capability and ca capacity of authors and reviewers in high quality and complete reporting. So if we go back to in vivo research and try and look at some of these things that I say have, have uh, introduced waste into in vivo research, well, if an experiment at high risk of bias is less than one at low risk of bias, say it's worth about 20% less. And if publication bias where 20% of experiments remain unpublished means that the work's of lesser value, the work that was unpublished is less, of lesser value, let's say it's 80% less because only the investigator knows it, and if an underpowered experiment is a waste of animals, then because only 8% of publications in the UK Russell Group report two or more measures to re reduce the risk of bias, let's say the waste is 20% of the 92%, or that's 18%, waste leaves 82%. Publication bias and the rest takes it down a bit more, and underpowered studies takes it down a bit more. And what that means 
is that if the blue on the outside is the potential value of research, and these are three things that we could do tomorrow to fix it, <coughs> excuse me, risk of bias takes away about uh, 20 or 30 percent, publication bias takes away 20 or 30 percent, and underpowered experiments take away 20, leaving about 40 percent. So I think it's very, very supportable to be able to say just now that 60 percent of animal research is wasted for these three simple things that we could do. Use of animals in research, that the use of animals in research can be ethical. But I think as a community, it's important for us to do what we can do to improve the use, improve the value that we get from that research. So, so that's my, my first sort of section. Are people all right for me to go on for an extend on, or do you want a little breather? I'll just carry on. <coughs> if I can. Any questions of, of, of that stuff? Because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go on to tell you how these tools of systematic review or give you some examples about how these tools can be applied to what you might call proper science. That's to say, finding out stuff about pathophysiology rather than me coming along as a clinician saying, tell me your data and I'm going to treat some patients. So this is for proper. And any questions about the first bit? So... If we now go to other uses of this, if you're doing experiments involving animal where you're testing pathophysiology or basic understanding of biology, some people would say what, that randomization and blinding aren't important there, but I can't see how that would be the case. These are the same types of experimenters, experiments done by the same investigators using the same models, the same statistical approaches. I think it's highly likely that they're also confounded by bias. We can look at the validity of research summaries. Have the authors of pivotal reviews considered all the relevant data? And we can look at the external uh, validity of findings. That is to say, do the findings hold only a limit, in a limited number of highly controlled situations, or are they generally applicable across biology? And one of the difficulties that we've got is that in our attempts to reduce the number of animals, the duration of experiments, the cost of experiments, we've refined our models so they're very good at producing large effect sizes. But the more and more we refine them, the less and less generalizable the findings of those studies are. So, so uh, this is a stupid analogy, but, but if I'm an animal that's about to have a stroke and you're going to try and protect me, and if I get everything for protection just right except my drug of interest, and the drug gives me a little push, then I've been protected. But if I'm just a normal animal going around and you give me a little push, nothing happens because I'm not ready. And all of our models, I think, have evolved over decades to be very good at identifying biological effects. So the added value of a systematic approach looking at animal data to identify and explain heterogeneity to develop a systematic evidence base for understanding complex pathological, biological pathological systems. And what I want to show you is some very recent work where we've used this approach to provide the components for mathematical modeling, which I think can start to tell us things which no individual study on its own can tell us because we're putting together data from many hundreds, many thousands of animals. So, this is my in vitro systematic review. It's, uh, others do this, uh, but it's, it's a long way behind uh, where we are for in vivo. I want to give you some examples. So, I want to talk about the external validity of time to treatment in animal stroke studies. I want to talk about the role of nitric oxide synthase species in, cerebral, in the pathophysiology of cerebral ischemia. The role of Th1 and Th17 cells in EAE, that's the in vitro bit. Identification of drug targets in EAE, I don't think I'm going to have, have time to talk about. Oh, no, I will talk about that. The identification of drug targets and target pathways for drugs and strokes. And the relative importance of AB40 and AB42 modeling in, in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. So here's validation of a concept in animals. You, you might imagine that when we published that paper saying that of 1,000 drugs that had been tested in stroke, 
only one actually work. People would say, well, it's a lousy model. It doesn't tell you anything. There's nothing about these models that are useful. Well, there is something that's useful because one of our concerns in human stroke is time to treatment. And the dogma is the sooner the treatment with a putative neuroprotective drug can be implemented, the better the outcome will be. TPA is not a neuroprotective drug. It's a clot-busting drug which works by opening up the blood vessel. And uh, here I'm contrasting it with a drug called Terilizad. They both appear to work in, human, in, in animals. TPA works in humans, but Terilizad doesn't. In TPA, in animals, the median time to treatment in animals was 90 minutes. And in the human clinical trial, the median time to treatment was 90 minutes. And in Terilizad, the median time to treatment in animals was 10 minutes. And for three quarters of the patients randomized in the clinical trials, the time to treatment was more than three hours. So Terilizad wasn't tested in humans in a situation where it had any chance of having efficacy given the effects of time to treatment. And here are the data for TPA in 90-minute epochs. So this is the reduction in infarct volume if the treatment's given in the first 90 minutes, the second 90 minutes, out to six hours here. And here's clinical studies, about 3,000 patients in a range of clinical trials of TPA for stroke, the decline in efficacy with time to treatment. Now, these curves aren't significantly different. And while it's reassuring that we can say, well, we've managed to model that quite well, I think this also tells you that animal models are good models of the time dependence of efficacy in animal stroke models. And so that's something positive that we can draw from this that, we'll, that we can build on when we try to build better models of disease. Uh, when I was uh, young, I spent too much time worrying about pathophysiological signaling within neurons, NMDA receptor activation, mobilization of intracellular calcium, activation of nitric oxide synthase, and how FK506 was going to save the world. Uh, and at that stage, there was lots and lots of arguments about what your NOS inhibitor should look like because there were some general NOS inhibitors and there were some specific NOS inhibitors. And then uh, Sol Snyder and others at Hopkins developed transgenic animals the way they knocked out endothelial nitric oxide synthase or inducible macrophage nitric oxide synthase or neuronal nitric oxide synthase. And still things were confusing and the results weren't very clear and that went on for a few years. So what we've done here is we've taken those animal data and we've done a systematic review. So here for ENOS, we identified 16 experiments involving over 300 animals. For INOS, 19 experiments, 320 animals. Neuronal NOS, 23 experiments, 402 animals. Now, this is knocking out a gene. So if you knock out a gene that's got a beneficial effect, you would expect to see a worse outcome. And if you knock out a gene that has a harmful effect, you would see a better outcome. And so here they are. ENOS, knockout makes things worse. INOS, a lovely gene dosage effect here. And these are the 95% confidence limits of the estimate. These aren't standard deviations or standard errors. And then NNOS being the worst of the lot, contributing most to neuronal death. Now, sometimes I find it difficult to believe individual gene knockout studies, but when I get data from 1,000 animals with confidence limits as tight as this, I think this is real, and I think this technique allows us to say that it's real. I also spent far too much of my youth reading tips and tins where they would commission artists to draw lovely diagrams like this. And you can always tell what the article's about by what's in the middle of the diagram. Uh, so this is a CDK5 article, presumably, because that's in the middle. And you've got trivial things like DNA damage and neuronal survival and death at the periphery. And you know, BCL2 is sort of hidden in here somewhere. But trying to understand the way that pathways work can be important. So about 10 years ago, uh, the, a new population of uh, T helper cells called the TH17 cell uh, was uh, uh, described. Uh, and the argument had previously been that it was the TH1 cell that was important for the development of immunogenicity in animal models of EAE. That is to say, you give the myelin-associated uh, uh, myelin oligodendrocyte like a protein, leads to a CD4 positive cell response, Th2 elaborating IL-4, uh, Th17 or Th1 elaborating gamma interferon, IL-2, IL-15. 
the question is which of these were responsible for the development of EAE, and there was a lot of debate. Usually, uh, with uh, so the question is whether it's mediated through Th1 cell population or Th17 population. Uh, and that debate usually was, uh, people attempted to answer it by flow cytometry, looking to see which cells were Th1 cells or which cells were Th17 cells. So what you can then do is you can look at experiments where they've measured the severity of EAE and the number of Th1 cells, and you can see whether they're concordant. If EAE is reduced, Th1 population is reduced. So concordance is along this diagonal here, or whether they're discordant. So in these six experiments here, the Th1 population was actually increased, but the severity of the EAE was reduced. And you can do a similar thing with the Th17 population, and here you see concordance along this line here, and these uh, three studies which are clearly discordant. And then if you plot that on a graph, you can try and uh, just look at this and by eyeballing it say, well, do I believe this, where there's quite a lot of discordant data, the size of the dots are the number of the experiments, the color of the dots is the quality of the, of the experiments. Or do I believe this, where the vast majority of the data are consistent with this being the pathway through which EAE is induced in EAE models? Next thing is surrogate outcome measures. Surrogate outcome measures are beautiful things. I'm doing a clinical trial in multiple sclerosis, for instance. And I want to measure how long it takes people to become wheelchair dependent. And from diagnosis, it takes the average patient about 20 years to become wheelchair dependent, if they ever do. So either I'm going to have to do a 20-year clinical trial, or what if I could get a surrogate measure in the CSF or the blood or looking in the eyes or on a scan that would tell me who was... Now, notwithstanding the difficulty that there is in, in, in having two sets of measurement error, because you've got the measurement error of the surrogate outcome and you've got the predictive error and that surrogate predicting the true outcome, but notwithstanding that, how do we choose which surrogate outcome we might measure, which will then predict the functional outcome that we would expect in patients? And is there a shortcut <coughs> that you might have some effects on a functional outcome without having an effect on that surrogate? Because the risk of that is that you would jump, you would bin a treatment saying it doesn't work because it doesn't change the surrogate, when in fact it would have an effect on functional outcome. So can animal models help us in this question, going back to my example of ischemic stroke? So what we were interested in is whether surrogate outcome in an animal, that is to say a measure of the volume of brain infarction, predicted a functional outcome, some behavioral task in that animal or not. And secondly, did that relationship hold across interventions or was it intervention specific? Because if it's not intervention specific, it's no use to me because I won't know the relationship between my surrogate and my functional outcome until I know the answer that I wanted to use the surrogate outcome to predict. But if it's the same across all interventions, then maybe it's something we could use. So what we did was we went to look for reports of the efficacy of candidate stroke drugs in our database in an animal model of ischemia where structural and functional outcome had been reported from the same cohort of animals and where they'd measured them at the same time. So the animal gets its behavior done and its infarct volume measured uh, immediately after the behavioral measure. And so we found a thousand studies which had done this. As, sorry, we found a thousand studies in the debate database at this time, of which 300 reported both at the same time. And you can see we've got lots in stem cells and thrombolytics and hypothermia and the rest scattered around other potential treatments. And there is a relationship between structural and functional outcome, which is reassuring, in that about 40% of the observed variation in behavior can be explained by the changes in infarct volume that a drug will induce. Interestingly, that means that about 60% of the changes that you observe in behavior aren't dependent on, on infarct volume, but we'll maybe come to that, come to that later. So the idea is that you lesion the animals, there is then a structural outcome, in part volume, in part size, which then results in either directly or via the structural outcome results in a functional outcome. And here you have drugs, first of all, 
which have an effect only through the structural outcome. So if you take away the blood clot, you make the infarct smaller, and that makes the animal better and perform better. But there are no independent effects of TPA on a functional, on a functional outcome. It's all mediated through this effect on the structural outcome. So TPA, other lytics, and interestingly, this drug NHY059 in animals. There are some interventions which have no effect at all on infarct size of any great importance, but have these effects on functional outcome. So stem cells, minocycline, NOS inhibition, uh, and the delay to treatment. So the longer the delay to treatment, the worse the functional outcome, independent of any effects on structural outcome. And then there are these drugs which seem to have independent effects on both structural <coughs> and functional outcome. And that's important, first of all, because it tells you a little bit about how these drugs work. It tells you a little bit about how you might derive a combination therapy. So a combination therapy of drugs of this class might not make nearly as much sense as taking one of these drugs and one of these drugs and combining them because they have effects in different places. And you might give the, t the, the treatment at different times. But critically, it also tells you that if you focus on a surrogate structural measure of outcome, as is commonly done now in clinical multiple sclerosis research looking at gray matter volume, then there are classes of drugs where you might miss a potential efficacy and not know about it. So, my, so the problem is you can only use a surrogate outcome measure when it's been validated as predicting the clinical outcome that you're interested in for the drug that you're interested in. And if that's the case, why bother with the surrogate outcome? Why not just measure the outcome that you're interested in? Because you're going to have to do that anyway. This is a, the use of mathematical modeling. So this is drug treatment in multiple sclerosis. The idea is that the animal is given an immunogen. This could be a human animal, potentially. Uh, we're not quite sure what causes multiple sclerosis. We think it's probably something to do with immune modulation due to early life infection. In the animal model, about 8, 10, 12 days after that immunog immunogen is given, the animal develops a behavioral phenotype of weakness and wasting and inability to complete tasks. And so you can divide uh, potential treatment stages into those pre-induction of disease, those which are post-induction pre-disease, and those which are in the disease state. And as far as we can tell, there are, there are probably three different uh, stages of MS, at least in the laboratory rat. There's this immune attack. So this causes an immune response which attacks the nerves. So lots of inflammatory cells. That attack then leads to demyelination. And you can look at that as an outcome in animals. And that may in turn, in time, lead to axon loss. What we can do then is look at animal experiments where they've measured more than one of inflammation, uh, what have we got? inflammation, demyelination, axon loss, and neurobehavior, and look at how much of the variation in the observed neurobehavior from over 287 experiments can be explained by these different pathways operating. And what you see is if you look at treatments that were given before they gave the immunogen which caused the disease, essentially treatments which stopped the model from developing, then all of the effect of neurobehavior is mediated through effects on inflammation, then through demyelination, and directly on neurobehavior. And this is a model that's been used extensively to develop drugs with exposure times of pre-induction or indeed of pre uh, pre-disease post-induction delivery of the drug. So this is when the animals had the immunogen. It's not yet developed a, a behavioral phenotype, but it's all brewing up. It's all happening. And here you can see that you can explain in total about 80% of the variation in neurobehavior through effects on inflammation, demyelination, and axon loss, with about 20% coming from other unidentified sources but most of the effects still coming through inflammation having an effect on demyelination, most of that effect on demyelination having a direct effect on neurobehavior, and very little having an effect through an effect on axon loss. But when you look at treatment in established disease, so when treatment is started after day eight, just when the animal's starting to develop the phenotype, at the time that my patients are first thinking about phoning their primary care physician to say, can I see you because my arm's not working, then all of the effect of inflammation is mediated through demyelination, 
and through axon loss and thence to new behaviour, with about 50% of the effect on new behaviour being mediated through, this is drug effects observed in animal studies, being mediated through other pathways that we don't know about. So in terms of the development of new treatments for multiple sclerosis, any drug which does not have an effect on axon loss is probably not worth trying anywhere unless you're arguing that it's got this novel effect that it's having some completely independent. But using beta interferon or Avonex uh, or glatirumor acetate or uh, some of the new immunomodulatory, immunomodulatory treatments, unless they have an observed effect on axon loss, they shouldn't go near human clinical trial. Uh, and then finally, just a, just a little, almost a little bit of fun. I, I, many years ago when I was doing my pharmacology undergraduate degree, I had a special interest in Alzheimer's disease and spent a lot of time listening to people arguing that either amyloid beta, so amyloid beta is the abnormal protein which is deposited. It comes in two flavors, amyloid beta 40, 40 kilodaltons, or amyloid beta 42, 42 kilodaltons. And the world is divided, well, the Alzheimer's world is divided into the amyloid beta community and the Taoists, the Taoists believing that amyloid beta is not at all important. But the amyloid beta community are divided into those that say amyloid beta 40 is a really important thing, amyloid beta 42 is not important at all. And those who say 42 is important, amyloid beta. This is looking at the ability of drugs to, to induce changes, improvements, in, in, the, in the abundance of amyloid beta 40 and amyloid beta 42, and the correlation between them is 74%. That's to say three quarters of their effect is shared. And this is a lovely straight regression mine. So people who say, oh, they do different things are, are, don't understand the data because on average, over all drugs, over all animal studies, they do pretty much the same thing. That's a very high correlation coefficient. So in vivo studies which don't report simple measures to avoid bias give larger estimates of treatment effect. <coughs> and unfortunately, most of those in vivo studies don't report the simple measures to reduce the risk of bias. Publication and selective outcome reporting biases are prevalent and they're important. And you can't, th there is no substitute for the critical reading of the details of a scientific report to forming a judgment as to whether, it's true, whether uh, th their conclusions are valid given the data. That they're, you can't rely on it being in nature. You can't rely on it coming from the world leader in the field. You can't rely on it coming from an institution of repute. And we've only been able to find these things out by studying large numbers of publications. So I think our data set now extends to something like 50,000 publications in various forms. And you are able then to detect really quite subtle things when you've got that amount of data. And then the final thing is I would say that any investigator who wants to set out to subvert their own experimental design can do so. There's always ways of doing experiment to give you a much better prospect of finding a positive result. And what's important for you as the reader, as the user of the research, of that research, is to be able to work out when it's happened. So how can we increase the chances of translational success where I started? Well, systematically review all the available data before you go in either to further animal research or into clinical trial. Conduct further in vivo experiments if indicated, and I'll show you some of that. Design your clinical trial according to what the animal data actually say, not what you would like them to say. And uh, finally, I'll just end on, on, on that slide in a little while, developing tools to allow rapid and living systematic reviews. So I said at the beginning that we'd been interested in identifying treatments that we could give patients with stroke that were known to be safe, that we could give patients in the back of an ambulance before they had their scan, before they'd got to hospital, because then we'd shorten the time to treatment. And we came up with three drugs from that list that we knew were safe, and they were magnesium and melatonin and minocycline, uh, and in systematic review and meta-analysis, they had substantial efficacy. <coughs> So we thought we would think about a clinical trial of those. But before we went to that clinical trial, we knew that we should test in animals whether they were effective in combination as well as individually, that there wasn't some cancelling out of each other's biological effects. So we went to uh, test triple M against infarct volume. Uh, and here you can see saline and melatonin in the dose that we identified 
and triple treatment, no significant improvement in outcome with an old spontaneously hypertensive rat with a two hour occlusion. So we lowered the bar, a young spontaneously hypertensive rat with a two hour occlusion, no effect. A young SHR with a one and a half hour occlusion, no effect. So these drugs which the literature claim in systematic review improve outcome, don't actually improve outcome in animal models of stroke. Uh, so let's move on to hypothermia. This is the, the intervention that's been tested in the large trial I was talking about, the systematic review we did with Bart van der Vork some years ago. And this shows 101 experiments, 220, 101 publications, 222 experiments, over 3,000 animals. Each dot is an individual experiment with its effect size. And this is the overall estimate of the treatment effect and its 95% confidence limit, a substantial improvement in outcome, almost as good as that drug that I showed you earlier on that didn't work. How much data? You've seen this before. There are lots and lots of data for hypothermia, so we can be sure that hypothermia adequately describes what happens in animals. We don't need more animal data as far as we can tell. What's the quality of the evidence? Uh, well, uh, these are the number of quality item, uh, checklist items scored, randomization, blinding the light, and even in the highest quality studies, the efficacy of hypothermia is maintained. Is there evidence of a publication bias? Well, there is, but even when you take into account publication bias, it still improves outcome by a third. And here are the dimensions of that efficacy, the duration of ischemia, whether it's a permanent or a temporary or a thrombotic occlusion model, the presence or absence of hypothermia, no difference in efficacy, the delay to treatment efficacy maintained if treatment is initiated out to six hours, and the depth of hypothermia. How cool do we have to get our patients before we get a beneficial effect? Well, here's a nice dose response effect with 35 degrees going down to 24 degrees. And there's efficacy at 35 degrees and at 34 degrees, which means that it's reasonable to target this temperature reduction rather than having to go all the way down to 32 or 33 degrees. And that's important because I can probably do 34 to 35 degrees on my stroke unit I would need to have an intensive care unit and a ventilator to get them down to 33 degrees. And I don't want to be putting 80 year old patients on a ventilator if I can avoid it because their morbidities of ventilator associated pneumonia would be very high indeed. So that allows us then to think about the design of a clinical trial, but still we're not sure about pethidin, which we have to give patients to stop them shivering. Does pethidin impact on the effect of hypothermia? Well, here's the experiment that we did randomized 72 rats. We excluded some because the drop in blood flow didn't meet our pre-specified inclusion criteria. One of them died. One of them had a periprocedure hemorrhage and four had a technical failure. Uh, Emily Senna, who did this work, has been very honest about the technical failure here. And the technical behavior here was that for three animals, the infarct volume was measured before the neurobehavior was measured. And to measure the infarct volume, you've got to kill the animal. And once the animal's killed, you can't measure its neurobehavior. So, but this, she's reported this in her publication. I was really silly. This is what we did. So people know that that's what's happened. Uh, but here you see the effect on infarct volume, uh, normothermic, normothermic with pethidin, hypothermic, hypothermic with pethidin. So we see the beneficial effect we expect, and it's not, effect, not impacted by pethidin. And that's infarct volume, and this is neurobehavior here. So that allows us then to go on to design a clinical trial truly based on the animal data. A 40% a, a improvement in outcome in animals, we are powered to detect a 7% improvement in humans. The quality of the evidence in animals, it's maintained in high quality studies, and it goes without saying that we are trying to conduct a high quality animal study. There is evidence of a publication bias in the animal data but we still see efficacy of more than 35%, even when we take that into account. And Eurohype 1 is registered with clinicaltrials.gov so that people will know we've been, done the study, even if we never get round, they'll know we've started the study, even if we never get round to publishing our results. And in animals, and this becomes more important, there's a good uh, range of evidence for the sex of the animal, the duration, delay to treatment, the intensity of treatment, uh, the uh, presence or absence of hypertension, whether or not the animal is reperfused. And that allows us to have a broad set of inclusion criteria in our clinical trial, which means we're likely to get the, to the answer of our clinical trial earlier. And the conditions of maximum efficacy, well, uh, apart from the temperature dependence, which I've talked about, 
uh, it's robust across a range of dimensions uh, and that allows us to have our target temperature of 34 to 35 degrees. So I would argue that when we're thinking about evidence-based translational medicine, we should think firstly about a systematic review and meta-analysis to ask the question of how powerful the treatment is, what's the quality and the range of the data, the evidence supporting those claims, whether there's evidence of publication bias and what the conditions are for maximum efficacy. And then moving on, and we've got some uh, FP7 funding to start to look at this. If I'm saying that you probably need 1,000 animals in well-conducted studies before you go to clinical trial, how are you going to get 1,000 animals in well-conducted studies? Well, doing it in one lab would take an awfully long time, but doing it in 10 or 20 labs would take much, take much less time. And so we are starting to pilot now multi-center animal studies to confirm efficacy, to have robust and monitored conduct of experiment, to have uh, uh, off-site randomization. So when you're putting an animal in, you go to your computer and it tells you the treatment allocation. When you're measuring the outcome, you take a video of the animal's behavior or you take a, a photograph of the, of, the, of the brain slice and you digitize it and you send it off and someone on the other side of Europe actually does the measurement, actually does the scoring, completely blinded to treatment group allocation. Transparent analysis and reporting and deliberately introducing heterogeneity. I said earlier on that some of our models are refined to the point that they're very good at showing an effect in that model but have very little generalizability. Whereas if we can deliberately spike uh, and introduce heterogeneity, age, weight, size, species, to our multicenter studies, then that gives us a better prospect of translation. And then finally, does anyone know who this is? This is Slim Whitman, who was a country music uh, 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 star of the past. Uh, and uh, our acronym for our new venture is the Systematic Living Information Machine, or SLIM, uh, because, uh, because uh, one of my colleagues has a passing resemblance. Do you have a thing called Movember in Italy, where men grow a moustache in November to raise money for a prostate? So Andrew's grow growing a moustache just now for Movember. The problem is that even uh, in the best hands of experienced systematic reviewers reviewing a clinical question, the delay between the last clinical trial data going in and the systematic review being published so that it can inform practice is two years. So you're already two years out of date, and that's, that's a problem when you're talking about clinical trials. When you're talking about in vivo research, where there's something like 4,000 new in vivo research articles every week for us all to keep up with, you know, our... Our MS systematic review last data in 2010. Our Alzheimer's review last data in 2009. It takes two, three, four years to actually do the work of extracting the data and doing the analysis. So are there ways that you can do that better? So you formulate your research question, always important. Uh, then you conduct a baseline systematic review and, and meta-analysis, and you'll always need to do that. But then can you use... Uh, uh, machine-based learning to develop and validate an automated search strategy. That's fairly straightforward. Most of us have got PubMed alerts that when something meets our criteria, we'll send us an email. But then can you use a machine to apply your inclusion and exclusion criteria to develop an algorithm for risk of bias assessment? And can you develop a machine that's actually able to extract data from papers? Well, I think extracting data from papers is difficult, but we've already got a machine that can perform almost as well as a, a human for uh, applying inclusion and exclusion criteria once it's had about 2,000 publications to learn from. And when you're screening a 60,000 publication data set, that's a lot of time saved. And if you can't get a machine to do it, can you use crowdsourcing? And you probably can't use crowdsourcing for inclusion and exclusion because this will be better, or for risk of bias assessment because this is probably better. But you could use crowdsourcing for data extraction. I often give talks to health charities, and for instance, the multiple sclerosis charity. What can we do to help? We've got 10,000 members in the UK who are desperate for... Well, you could do this. You could be trained for data extraction from scientific papers, and you could contribute to a system that allowed you to have continuously updated systematic views and meta-analysis in a defined research area. So if you wanted to know the most up-to-date summary of what the animal data were saying about multiple sclerosis, you would go to our website and you would type in a question and you would get a systematic review that the website did while you were on it. 
And so every time someone puts a new bit of data, the system reviews updated, so you would have bang up to the minute information. You're all young, mostly young. Uh, and I thought I would end with some reflections about what science is and what it isn't. And my, the thing that surprised me most when I thought about it was that we are not a profession. We like to think of ourselves as having many of the attributes of a profession, but we're not a profession. So if you think about specialist training, well, yes, PhDs, that's our specialist training. All of these have specialist training, including football players. Uh, football players have a regulatory body, uh, but scientists don't have a regulatory body that we are members of. Membership of the football players regulatory body requires that they sign their code of professional ethics and that they engage in continuing professional development. So every professional soccer player goes off every year on a course for this or that, presumably how to bite or how not to bite or how to become a football manager or something. Uh, but they've got to do this as part. And all of these other professions also have a code of professional ethics, ethics a regulatory body, and systems for continuing professional development. Now, some countries are at different sta stages of this than others, and this is the situation, situation in the UK, but I think, generally speaking, across all countries, science is much less professional than it should be, and we pay much, much less attention to making ourselves better at what we do. I've been a, a consultant neurologist, professor of neurologist, board certified neurologist, whatever you want to call it, for 10 years now, and every year, I have to demonstrate that I've done at least 50 and preferably 100 hours of continuing professional development so I'm up to date with what's known in neurology and I'm up to date with best practice. As a scientist, I'm 20 years post-PhD and I've never had to do anything to demonstrate that I'm any better than the day two people sat opposite me at a table and said, yeah, that's all right, which is what happens to most of us. So you've seen my key messages before. Um, this is done through Camarades, an, an international network now with representation in most countries around the world. If you want to build systematic review and meta-analysis of in vivo data into your research plans, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, and uh, we are funded now from the UK government to support other groups wishing to do this. Uh, and we'd be very happy to hear from you. So I've got no idea what, oh, I'm slightly early. Uh, so we've got 12 minutes for questions, uh, but thank you very much for your attention and for your time.